1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 through 24, as we continue our series in 1 Corinthians, we're looking at this time around just at verses or chapters 5 through 7. Uh, Jared will close out chapter 7 next week. This morning we look at the third of four messages out of 1 Corinthians 7. God's Holy Spirit moved the Apostle Paul to write these words. Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation that he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freed man. Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Don't become slaves of men. Brothers, each man is responsible to God, should remain in the situation God called him to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, teach us your word. We ask that you, in the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears. May we see and hear Jesus and him only. May we glorify him with our attention. May we glorify him with our intentions to put into practice what we learn in this hour, to say, yes, I will, regardless what it is Jesus calls me to do. May we have an understanding, gain understanding in this text. Father, by your grace, may we be obedient children. We pray these things again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I, uh, one of the things that happens when you get older is that you remember that you told somebody something, but you can't remember the somebody that you told. So if I'm repeating myself, I am very sorry. When I was 23 years old, I was the program director at a camp in New England. And being the program director at that time meant that I was second in command. A 23-year-old, people sent their kids anyway. It was nice of them to trust me. The, the camp director was only 25 or 24 or 25, so he wasn't a whole lot older than me. But uh, he took a day off. And the day off that he took happened to coincide with the day that a hurricane hit New England. We knew it was coming. And if you've ever been in a hurricane, you know that there are super high winds and lots and lots of rain. And I, on that day, was in charge of making sure that 150 campers and staff were safe, not soaked, and content. It was supposed to start raining at midnight. And so I didn't exactly know what to do, but in the interest of caution, I told the young man who was working maintenance and uh, coordinating the stuff for us there at the camp, I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get every spare mattress that you can find in this camp. I want you to move it into the largest of all of the buildings that we own. The campers were in tents or in cabins. The cabins at least had screens. The tents sometimes had the sides rolled up. You, if you ever watched MASH, it was that kind of tent. We just didn't put screens up. But that was what our campers were, were in. And so I said, Lord, I'm afraid that what's going to happen with these high winds is it's going to blow all that rain into the cabins and into the sides of the tents. So just in case we have a problem, put as many mattresses as you can in the dining hall, and we'll sleep them there tonight. So he got every mattress he could find. It was nearly enough mattresses for everybody in the camp. And at midnight, when it was supposed to start raining, I walked around the camp and discovered that everybody was indeed dry. There was no wind at that point. The rain was coming straight down. It was pouring. It was coming down very hard, but it was coming down straight. I went to bed, set my alarm for one hour, got up at an hour and walked around the camp again. 
rain was still coming down straight. I did it a third time. I may have done it a fourth or fifth. Honestly, I don't remember. The next day, we had used any of those mattresses that were in the dining hall. Before we could eat breakfast, Chuck had to get all of them and take them back out of the dining hall. And all day, the campers and the staff made fun of panicked Jim. Made fun of alarmist Jim because I was so scared that they were going to get wet that I had thought that maybe they'd sleep in the dining hall. You know, I've wrestled with that decision for 50 years. It wasn't until just this last week I talked with the former camp director of that camp. My dad had directed it for five years. I told him what I would, that I, I just didn't know whether I'd done the right thing, made the right decision. He said, that's what I would have done in your place. I thought, okay, I'm all right. On what basis do we make our decisions? I'd like to tell you that my decision was because of hours on my knees in prayer seeking God, that I was seeking his honor and glory in all of that. To be honest with you, I just didn't want to be wrong. If it poured and got all those campers wet, I didn't want to be the one responsible. More than anything else in life, I fear being wrong. That's why I'm Presbyterian. I want you to know that. Presbyterians aren't wrong. We're, you know, I'm, just, I'm teasing. <clears throat> we are convinced that we are always right. <clears throat> why or how do you make the decisions that you make? The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of people who are divided as a church. Now, some of that division takes place because they're literally, physically apart. Paul writes about the fellowship that they enjoyed in chapters 15 and 16 and what they need to remember in order to stay one body despite separated by distance. In chapters 1 through 4, he says, it's not just separation that creates your division, it's sects, S-E-C-T-S. You've got divisions among you. One says, I'm of Paul. One says, I'm of Cephas. One says, well, I'm better than both of you. I'm of Christ. We've got all kinds of things that divide us, and he reminds us that wisdom is seeking God first. And that in seeking Christ, we become one as being in Christ. We are one, and we strive to maintain the unity that we have. And then in chapters 5 through 7, he deals with intimate, interpersonal relationships. He deals with the things that we get divided by because those are areas in which our culture tempts us. Our own bodies tempt us. Our own desires tempt us. It's one of the greatest struggles in human existence to deal with this idea of wanting to be intimate with another individual, wanting to be so close that we enjoy each other as well, wanting all of that and yet wanting it rightly. Chapter 7, Paul begins to nail that down. Jared did a wonderful job two weeks ago of explaining to us the goodness of God and the graciousness of God in giving us first the gift of marriage so that we can have a place rightfully to fulfill what he created us with in those desires. Secondly, God gives us guidelines for how to live in those relationships and how to live in marriage. And then he gives us the grace through our partner who keeps us from the temptations that so easily beset, grows us in our fruits as we bear self-control. And then last week, we discovered that God takes those guidelines in marriage and he gives us principles on which we make some of those uh, decisions in marriage and we enjoy the relationships that we have. We always go for the best. We go for what God has in mind. Secondly, we go for what God commands. Thirdly, we go for what God has done with us in covenant and we strive both to fulfill the covenant with Christ and to extend the covenant to the next generation. And finally, we go for the call, what God has called us and where God has called us. And Paul doesn't want to leave us just with that principle. He wants us to understand that on the basis of that principle, the call of God, we make our decisions. And so he gives us three more principles from verses 17 through 24. They're kind of sub-principles. They're things that we do to understand a little bit better the call of God and the way that helps us to make decisions, not just in interpersonal relationships, but in all areas of life. If you remember the four from last week and the three we're going to talk about this morning, I believe you'll have a good basis on which to make the decisions that God puts before you. Many, it, you know, it wouldn't have been wrong for me not to have gotten all of those beds into the dining hall. 
the most necessarily right. There's not always a right and wrong. I think that we've got the ability to make those things, but we want to be wise because we want to do it God's way. So God says, okay, let me give you three more principles that'll help you make that, those decisions. The first principle then, as we dig in, is the principle of responsibilities. Paul, what Paul does here in, in each of the divisions in this few verses is remind us three times that we're to retain the position or retain the ministry that we had when we were called. That marks off each of those. And so from verses 17 through 19, he says, here's how, and he uses the example of circumcision. Verses 20 to 24, he says, here's how that you retain that place in life in which we were called. And he gives us the example of slavery. And then finally, at the end, he gives us just one verse that contains in itself the principle for us. So verses 17 through 19, what he does is sum it up with saying this, keeping God's commands is what counts. Now, you and I have the calling of God, the calling of God to obedience, the calling of God to a situation in life, the calling of God to talents and gifts that we have, the calling of God in the scriptures, first and foremost, is a call to salvation. Secondly, we understand, we understand the general call of God as the gospel proclaimed, and then the particular call of God, or the specific call of God to individuals as he works in their heart through the general proclamation of the gospel, life and faith, so that we're capable of making the decision and making the choice to love God and to serve God because of what he has given us in grace. But secondly, we understand the word calling and the way we use it most often has to do with vocation. Now, I believe that we have come far enough as American Christians that we understand that the only people who are called to specific vocations are not preachers and missionaries. Each of us is called to a specific responsibility, given gifts by God, talents, loves to do things. I, I, we've been watching a variety of programming on TV. We, we noticed lately a show called Counting Cars. It's, uh, some guy in Las Vegas calls himself the Count. He goes around and he looks for old cars and then he spruces them up, looks, makes them look brand new. It usually costs twenty-five dollars to fifty thousand dollars, but he, that's his love. And he just loves cars. I'm amazed that, to the best of my knowledge, not a believer, and yet God has placed within something, within him, a love for cars, and he gets to work at that. Remember Paul Harvey said, if you're able to get paid for doing something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. The ability that we have in this culture to take what we love and do it daily and get paid for it. God chooses to do that. But it's the gifting of God in us that gives us those loves, gives us those capacities. Even if it's just fulfilling the responsibility of loving family enough to take a job we don't love as well, but we love the family and we work. God at work within us, equipping us for our vocations. But then the context that he has here is the call to marriage. And I believe this, that generally speaking, more of us are called to marriage than are not. If most of us were not called to marriage, the church would certainly begin to dwindle fairly quickly because we aren't doing a really good job of fulfilling the call to evangelism. We're at least doing a pretty good job of getting married and having kids. And so we're raising up godly seeds, says the book of Malachi, children who will inform the next generation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, children who will live it before that generation. Children, the calling of God, the responsibility that we have. Secondly, we have God's sovereignty. We are in circumstances in which God places us. God doesn't place us in those circumstances so that we're to use him as a consultant in those circumstances. God places us there because he is absolutely sovereign. He's put us in those things so that we shine like stars in the universe, says Philippians. He says, your circumstances, whether you are circumcised or not, are immaterial. They're what I have given you. Use them to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. Understand Galatians 3.28 says, or 3, 3.28 says this, there in Christ there is no 
Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. All of us have received the same call. We've all received the same gift of salvation. We've already received the same down payment, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. There's an equality among us. We don't need to become something else, either in ethnicity or in religious rights. We don't need to be circumcised. We don't need to be uncircumcised. We just need to obey the commands of God. And that is where we're going with that third sub-point, the commands of God. Now, when we say the commands of God, I believe that for the majority of us here, the first thing that comes to mind is the Ten Commandments. Well, it should to some regard because it is a statement of the character of God and it is something to which we aspire to reflect the character of God in others. But we forget all too often that there are by far more commands in the New Testament than there are in the Old Testament. Things for us to do that have every bit as much force in life as the commandments had. All of the commands in the Old Testament, the Jews will tell you that there are 600 and some different commands in the Old Testament. We worry about those when Paul says the Old Testament law, civil, moral, ceremonial, the Old Testament law was given so that we would understand this, we're sinners. And there were so many laws that affected so many areas of life because God wanted us to understand this. He is holy and we are not. And there is nothing in us, in any aspect of our life, that makes us accessible to God. Everything in life is anathema to him because we are fallen creatures. Stuck under the slavery to sin, in the bonds of sin, in the curse of sin. But in the New Testament, the commands of God are given, as we understand now from the New Testament perspective, were the Old Testament commands. They're given to us so that we understand what it is to do righteousness. There's a positive statement to each of the eight negative commands. In a couple of weeks, we're going to start a new series in the Ten Commandments. And we're going to look at those and grasp a better understanding from the New Testament perspective of what the commands of God are. But I believe that we need to worry every bit as much about the New Testament commands, if not more, than we worry about those 10 in the Old Testament. When was the last time that you got up and you confessed, God, I didn't take the opportunity yesterday to evangelize when you put it before me? He told us to go into all the world and to make disciples. Are you actively and aggressively seeking those to disciple? The only raw material for tomorrow's disciples of Jesus Christ are today's non-believers. Which of them are you praying for? Which of them are you seeking to lead to faith in Jesus Christ? He tells us to live at peace with everybody. That means even when you're driving and you're ticked at the guy in front of you because he didn't signal before he hit his brakes and turned. God calls us to do everything we can to reflect the glory of Jesus Christ to a world around us. I don't think that those are three of the top things that we spend our time doing. And I'm talking to me, not just to you. God calls us to commands in the New Testament, positive things, to do righteousness. And he says, those are the things I want you to do. You have a responsibility in Christ to make your decisions based on the responsibility that you have to Christ. The things that he has done for you. Decisions are about and are based on pleasing God. We're men pleasers. We watched Perry Mason at night. Perry Mason was talking to a college student. He said, I'm on the horns of a dilemma. One of my fellow students stole a test from the professor so that we would have all of the answers. I didn't look at him, but I don't want to think on my fellow student. But I also want to please my dad who wants me to tune that stu- turn that student in. And I don't know what to do. He says, Perry, you just don't understand the, the pressures that are on this generation. You didn't have them before. Perry says, you're nuts. We had all kinds of pressures before. What you need to understand is that you are making your decisions on the wrong standards. It's within you to make the right decision. You have to make this question, you answer the question, what's right? In these circumstances, not what your dad wants, not what your fellow students want, what's right. And you're capable of making that decision. So make it. Perry isn't even a believer. 
The actor that played Perry isn't a believer. The guy who wrote Perry Mason is not a believer. But he understands there are standards up to which we measure. And we need to live by those and quit worrying about being either men-pleasers or self-pleasers. If you're genuinely in faith in Jesus Christ, then I believe this of you. You want to please God. You want to hear, good job. Now, unfortunately, in our fallenness, we want to hear good job because we want to think that we deserve God's favor. We deserve God's reward. He says, no, you just, you just be faithful servants. Just do what I tell you. But do what I tell you. We need to remember that we're soldiers, servants, but soldiers. No soldier, says Paul in 2 Timothy 2, gets involved in civilian affairs. Instead, he wants to please his commanding officer. You want to know what it looks like to, to please your commanding officer? I encourage you to rent or look up and see the movie No Time for Sergeants. It's an old film. It's got Andy Griffith in it. I think it's his first feature film, but don't hold me to that. But in it, all he wants to do is please his sergeant. And every decision he makes in that movie is about pleasing his sergeant. Can you imagine what it would look like if every decision that we made was about pleasing Jesus? We'd look different to the world. We'd make different decisions because what we want to do is please Jesus. Secondly, I want you to note the position. That's the second principle. Don't become slaves of men. When you come to faith in Christ, you have a new position. You have the position of freedom. You used to be slaves to sin. Now you're slaves to righteousness. You used not to be able to do righteousness. Now you can. You're free. Secondly, you dwell in the heavenly realms. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, God has placed us with Christ, who according to chapter 1, is seated now in the heavenly realms. He said, you're seated with Christ in those heavenly realms. You're a wonderful servant from Bruce Baker years and years and years ago. He said, keep looking down because your perspective should be from where you're seated in the heavenlies. You're looking down on your circumstances from the position of power that you have in God, seated with him in heavenly realms. But thirdly, your position is that of co-inheritors with Christ. We're sons. First John 3, 1, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons, the children of God. We have a new position, and it comes because God has changed us. God has changed us from being sinners to doing and loving and reflecting the righteousness of God. That's the cause. The second cause, though, is that there's a cost involved. Jesus Christ bought us. I want you to stop for just a few minutes at the risk of going way over I don't want to glide past the cost, the fact that we belong to Jesus Christ. I I came to faith in Christ when I was six. One of the things that I believe is true of second and third generation Christians, fourth and fifth, those of us who come to faith in Christ so early in life that we don't know what it is not to know Jesus Christ, is that we really don't know the heinousness of sin. We really don't fully understand the cost of Calvary. Let me give you two insights into the cost of Calvary. First, God took sin, all the sin of those who would trust in Jesus Christ, and he put it on Jesus. Now, you've got to understand and try to think of what it would be like to be holy and to hate sin. We kind of like it. It's pleasurable. But God hates it. It's anathema to God. He wants nothing to do with it. He damns it. He hates it. It is his exact opposite. And yet, in the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, he became a man. And at a place called Calvary, God put on that man God all the sin of those who would trust him. All the things that he hates, he now possesses as he's on the cross. Everything that he's against, everything that he has judged, everything that he hates, he now bears the cost. But it gets worse. And you're thinking, well, yeah, he died. No, 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 no. The worst part is really not the death. The death, I think, was in a way a relief. 
Jesus said, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's finished. I've already done the hardest part. But we miss the hardest part if we think that all he got was sin. Because with the sin came a curse. Imagine what it would be like to be the holy God. So to hate sin that you curse your own son. You're beginning to understand some of the cost to God for our salvation. We, we take it so glibly. We, we take it so matter-of-factly. It cost God a lot. And with that, he bought uh, those of us who trust in him. We now belong to Jesus Christ. But that's a good thing. It's a whole new position. No longer belonging to the forces of darkness. No longer belonging to sin. No longer belonging even to ourselves and our own desires and our own fallenness. We belong to Jesus Christ who promised that not only he's going to call us sons and we're going to be co-inheritors, he's going to conform us into his image. We're going to look like the perfect God, Jesus. Isn't that something? The privilege of being the recipient of the cost. But the result is priorities. God's priority. The result is now, in gratitude, we want to please God. He's done so much for us that there should be a natural bubbling up response of, I want to do what pleases God. And I know that because I keep looking to God. Decisions are about an based on looking to God. God says it this way in, in Hebrews 12, verse 2. He says, we're always looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. The one who set the example for us of what it is to look ahead to what God has promised and to scorn the shame of what's behind us, the guilt that we sense, the shame that we feel at what we used to be. Paul says, I put those things behest, I, behind me. I press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I can now, and I do, because I have a whole new set of priorities. We look to people, real or imaginary. We look to people to see how they vote. We look to people to see what music they like. We look to people to see everything so that we can make our decisions. God says, no, when you come to faith in me, you look to Christ. God gave us a new leader. God gave us a new example. He gave us a new peer group. He put us with people who also know and love and serve Jesus. He gave us new standards, and he wrote them on our hearts. We can do them now. Everything is new for us in Christ. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus. In uh, the old TV show, Combat, they captured a group of enemy soldiers, and they all were dressed as privates. But the sergeant knew somebody there was in charge. And somehow those of us who were watching knew that the someone who was in charge was a lieutenant in the enemy army. But he was dressed as a private. And he wanted to find out who he was. And so he said, will you please tell me who's in charge here? And they all just, they figured it was going to go worse for the officers. And so they didn't tell who it was. And so he selected one of them. And he says, you'll talk. And he took him outside. And where no one else could see him, they pointed a gun at his head, and then they pulled the trigger. And all the people inside heard was the scream of the guy who had the gun pointed at him, and the click of the trigger and the explosion of the shell. And they thought, they killed one of our guys. He come back in, he says, okay, who's your leader? And all the guys are standing there, and they all look to one man. And he knew who the leader was. He hadn't really killed the soldier outside. He simply fired the gun to make them think he had. But he knew who was in charge because they looked to him in times of stress. Who do you look to? Who do you look to in times of stress? Who do you look to in times of good? Do you have your eyes on Jesus? Or do you have your eyes on people around you? I want to be like Mike, not be like Jesus. Who are you looking to, thirdly? I want you to note the relationship. In verse 24, he says it this way, and our, our text translates it as responsible to God. You're saying, Jim, you already talked about responsibility. He's talking there about 
call. It's a call to salvation, a call to the responsibilities that we've already called, talked about, a call to what God wants. But I think it's to be a, a call to us to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I want you to think back for just a moment into the 12 men that Jesus called to be his disciples, to be his apostles. He says in three books of the Bible what they were called to. He says, I want you to do the preaching of the kingdom of God and the casting out of demons. But Mark adds a third, and he puts that ahead of the other two. Mark says, Jesus called 12 to be with him. Do you know that's really what salvation is about? It's about you and I being with God now and forever. Living in his presence at the moment. Living coram deo. Living with God moment by moment. Not because he follows me around, but because I follow him around. Living with God. And then fit for his presence. In the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In his obedience on us. God takes us home. Why? To be with him. That's the bottom line. So you and I are to make decisions not only based on the responsibility that we have in Christ, not only based on the position we have in Christ as those looking to him, but on the relationship that we have with Christ. The fact that we can be with him. The literal translation of this verse has to do with closeness. It doesn't say what the NIV says. It says, it says this, each in which he was called brothers, in this let him remain beside God. Para, beside, Theu, God. What he's remaining in is this relationship that we have to be with God. Decisions are about and based on being with God. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. We still fear God. We we want to get close, perhaps, on our terms. We want him to overlook and accept us in our sins. Don't we think that love means accept me as I am? And we think that that's what God does, is accepts us who we are, as who we are. Yes and no. No, he doesn't accept you as sinners. Yes, he accepts you as sinners saved by grace. Sinners in Jesus Christ. It's because of Christ. You're acceptable to God, and I'm acceptable to God. Not as we are, as we're becoming like Jesus, as we're being with Jesus. It's not about fearing God. John tells us that fear has to do with punishment. It has to do more with reverence of God. We can call him daddy. We can understand that we're sons. It's a relationship of love, not of fear, not of legalism, not... A, it, it's a relationship because we love God. And we love God because he first loved us. Hootie and the Blowfish. That's a fantastic name for a rock band. I feel like Dave Barry right now. Uh, it's no longer a rock band. Darius Rucker, who was Hootie in Hootie and the Blowfish, is now a country western singer, does a solo act. But their biggest hit was Only Want to Be With You. No matter... What else is this all about? I only want to be with you. Imagine for a moment that you sang that daily to God. All I want is to be with you. For me to live, says Paul, is Christ. I could be with him. Though I want to go and be with him, but I'll stay for your benefit. I want to be with God. Let me ask you this morning, what are your principles? On what do you make your decisions? What informs you? Is it I'm afraid of being wrong. I'm afraid of being here. First, are you close to God? I mean that in two ways. Are you related to him at all? Are you a child of God? Have you come to that point where you've said, I'm a sinner. That's what separates me from God. And I want to be with God. God has put a desire in my heart to please him, to obey him, to know him, to be with him. Have you come to that point in life where you can say, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is all the world to me. Have you come there at all? I know. I don't sound soft and tender, but softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Sinner, come home. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. You say, Jim, I, I've done that. Okay. Are you drawing near to God? Are you holding God off 
arm's length. God, no, this is what I want to do. Bless this. Are, are you saying, God, I, I need some wisdom on this, and you're using him as a consultant? What's your relationship like with God? Isn't that what personal worship is all about? We're building a relationship with God. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes getting to know him. He's revealed himself in his word. He tells you who he is. He even gives you grace in that word to draw near to him. Get to know that God. Get to love and serve that God. Secondly, are you focused on God? Are you looking to Jesus as the example? Are you looking to Jesus for help? Are you looking to Jesus as what you're supposed to do? Are you looking to Jesus? Or are your eyes on somebody here? Something that the world has to offer. What are your eyes on? What are you about? And then thirdly, are you obeying God? Are you searching his word for what to do? Or are you searching his word to find out if it's okay if you do what you want to do? Why are you reading the Word of God? Because you want His grace to grow closer to Him? Do you, are you seeking to do what God wants? Are you obeying God? Let me close with this. Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz comes to a man hanging on a pole. And she scratches her head and she says, which way am I supposed to go? And y'all, I hope you all have seen the movie. All of you have seen the movie. He says, well, you can go this way or you can go that way. He says, where do you want to go? She says, I don't know. He says, then I guess it doesn't make any difference which way you go, does it? You and I have come this morning to a man on a cross. He's risen from the dead. He's not still on the cross. But the man who was on the cross is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to know, he'll inform your decisions. Which way do you want to go? Your way, he's not going to give you any help. His way, he'll come down, he'll walk beside you, and you'll go in the right direction, and you'll make decisions informed rightly. You think about that. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, give us grace. Amen.